Consider for a moment this statement, the opening lines of a much longer statement signed by 30 scientists. Creationism and intelligent design are not scientific theories, but they're portrayed as scientific theories by some religious fundamentalists who attempt to have their views promoted in publicly funded schools. There should be enforceable statutory guidance that they may not be presented as scientific theories in any publicly funded school of whatever type, but this is not enough. An understanding of evolution is central to understanding all aspects of biology. The teaching of evolution should be included at both primary and secondary levels in the national curriculum and in all schools. One of the people who put his name to that is Professor Richard Dawkins, who's live on PM, along with Simon Morris, who's Head of Science at an Outer London Comprehensive School. He teaches across the syllabus, including biology, chemistry and physics. And Simon Morris, do you find much to disagree with in that statement from some of your fellow scientists? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit worried because it sort of almost comes across in a bigoted fashion. Uh, we demand that evolution should be taught, and it is science, and anyone who disagrees with us is wrong. Whereas, really, it's about beginnings, and beginnings are very difficult for scientists to test and reprove because they only happen once, and we don't have people there. So there doesn't seem to be any evidence for spontaneous evolution, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence for spontaneous ex nihilo creation either. So both of them really are theories, and neither of them perhaps is science. It depends what science is. What do you teach in, in your classrooms? Uh, well, I try to teach people deductive logical reasoning, and we base this from science that experiments are repeatable, we can learn lessons from that, and we can collect data. So it's to do with repeatable observation. But it's not just about collecting data. You then have to use that data to explain the world we live in it, and ultimately our place within the world. What sort of weight should be given to uh, intelligent design, for example, which, uh, as I understand, you, that's something you believe in? Uh, I, I don't know about, about weight. You see, as I said before, it depends on what science is. Uh, I, I teach my children to pass exams, basically. It's my job to mediate the knowledge so they can understand. And a lot of the science curriculum is very fact-based. And by fact, we talk about repeatable observations that we can see and that we can perform. And it's explaining how they fit together in our world view that helps students understand it and be able to repeat it and pass their exams. And so the idea about sort of creative design is just an, another possibility, a way of viewing how these facts that we collect could fit together. So I, I don't think it should have an, a, a large bias from that point of view. I think it's more philosophical. But we have to know the reason why we're studying things because all we've managed to do is find out how things work in a more intricated and uh, clever manner. So the more we find out about how they work, the more we then end up finding more questions. And none of these ever give us any of the whys. We just know that cells now work this way, uh, and we don't know why they work that way or what starts them off, but we have a very complicated, clever way of seeing how they go. And that can help us change people's lives and improve medicine or change the design of materials depending on which area you're working in, or understand the maths, or be able to explain why a positron could exist. Well, let me bring in Richard Dawkins, um, and I suppose I should give you a chance, first of all, to respond to the, the idea that that statement is, is almost bigoted. Oh, no. Um, I mean, I'm all for uh, science being taught in a questioning way. Um, we must foster critical thinking, and that's fine, and there's plenty of critical thinking going on in science. What Mr. Morris seems to be basing his case on is the idea of science being repeatable, and he doesn't think evolution, evolutionary theory is repeatable because it only happened once. That, of course, is a very narrow view of repeatability. Just because it happened in the past doesn't mean that we can't do repeatable observations, for example, on the fossil record, for example, on the molecular genetics of living species. These are all repeatable observations or experiments that we can do. So even though each evolutionary event may have only happened once in the past, nevertheless, the whole evolutionary process is amply supported by multifarious repeatable observations. Simon Morris. Well, that's interesting because he said, I can look at the data, I can look at the data, I can look at the data, and I can look at the data. And in fact, I can look at the fossil record. Uh, I'm, I'm not an apologetist, if that's a correct word. I, I, I teach science, and I've only skimmed through things, so I'm sure he has greater knowledge than me. But 
the fossil record is about buried things, and we're not, well, I say we're not sure how old these things are. They're well, we are sure ways. how old they are. We know very well how old they are. We know okay. from radioactive dating. Right, and we could sit here and we could argue about radioactive dating. Well, we how? Could talk about I mean, potassium what? argon capture, and we could talk about uranium depletion, and we could talk about those things, but... My point about the science is that I'm involved in is it's something that we can repeat the actual act of the science, not the act of the observation. And Professor Dawkins, so, can I ask you what role you think creationism and intelligent design should have in any part of the curriculum in this country? I think it's fine to teach uh, religion in religious studies, and we have religious studies in the national curriculum, and I think that's fine. I'm actually in favour of teaching religious studies, and that is where creationism belongs. It isn't science. Uh, to evade the responsibility to give a scientific explanation by, in effect, saying a magic man did it or a wizard did it is not a, an explanation in any th sense you could possibly call scientific. Do you agree it's possible to believe in intelligent design but not to be religious? I find that rather hard to see how you could... I could be interested to hear if Mr Morris can do that... Um, I suppose you could just about say maybe life on this planet was designed by intelligent life on another planet. Uh, Francis Crick once rather tongue-in-cheek suggested that. Uh, but in that case, of course, you're still left with the problem of explaining where the life on the other planet came from. And then Francis Crick would certainly have agreed that that must have evolved. Simon Morris, in the unlikely event you have a quick answer to that, please give it now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well... Faith and religion is when you, you base an opinion on perhaps a lack of evidence. And although Mr Dawkins has never seen evolution happen, he believes it does. Therefore, it is faith. Um, there are consequences of his faith, though, and there are consequences of design faith. If a god does exist, or a creator, I'm not saying which one, whether it's Christian or Islam or, or something like that, then you have a responsibility to that god, and you have social restraint, and you have control. I just if want we to have evolution, Richard which Dawkins, is last a word. No, I random want, process. It, it, it is not a random control, process. Evolution and is, we have so we have selfishness at the centre. Evolution Self is, is not important. a random process. Selfishness is not at the centre. It does not depend upon faith, because as I said before, we can do repeated observations. This is proper science, and it's done on repeatable observations and even experiments. Thank you both for joining us, Professor Richard Dawkins and Simon Morris. Our email address is pm at bbc.co.uk.